give this inaugural lecture. I'm especially honoured by Edna Salogy, Bobby Wilcox, Peter Jacobs, and their gracious welcome to me. Thank you. And thank you to Workers Well Media Productions for organising this great public meeting. You know, the concept of democracy in emerging and liberated nations, which inspired the Salogy Trust, interests me very much. South Africa is where much of my political education took place. It was here that I confronted the denial of a people's democracy in its most debased form. The classification and reclassification of people by race, achieved by a man, as I saw, running a comb through the hair of a child that remains vivid in my memory. Nor shall I forget, as a 24-year-old reporter, watching a large drunken white man throw coins on the ground and order an elderly black man to pick them up. The choice before me then was rage or ensuring that these notorious incidents were put before the outside world. I chose the latter. Such was the privilege that journalism had given me, a privilege that too many journalists today have abandoned. This lecture is dedicated to the honourable exceptions to those who have led an insurrection of subjugated knowledge, of ideas and hope in South Africa and all over the world, and whose courage and tenacity are needed now more than ever. One photograph has pride of place on my wall in London. I pass it on the stairs every day. It's always thrilling to behold, it gives me hope. It shows a lone woman standing between two armoured vehicles, the infamous hippos, as they rolled into Soweto. Her arms are raised, her fists are clenched, her thin body is both beckoning and defiant of the enemy. It's May Day 1985, the final uprising against apartheid has begun, and she is an emblem of her people. The photographer was Paul Weinberg, who had crouched in a ditch as a column of hippos invaded Soweto. All around him, people fought back with stones facing live ammunition. In the ditch beside me, he told me, was this bird-like woman who pulled out a bottle of gin, took a swig, then went over the top and marched straight into the moving line of vehicles with shotguns pointed at her. It was one of the bravest things I'd ever seen. When I first came to South Africa in the 1960s, I met many such courageous people, often secretly. The enemy was the state, ruthless and efficient, and many of them didn't survive. When I returned in the 90s, I was astonished to find that the spirit of resistance had survived and had flourished. I met men and women who had fought apartheid in the townships as part of the UDF. I met miners whose great strike had terrified the regime. I met former high school students in Soweto whose bravery had reawakened the struggle and meant there was no turning back. Charity Condili, whose son Sizwe was tortured and murdered by the state, told me she wanted neither reconciliation nor an apology, but justice. For justice, she said, is freedom. The resistance fighter and unionist Mabui Nguenda 
said memorably, what is freedom if we don't have it? It's a foolish word, it's propaganda. What we want is for the gates of our economic prison to open. That's freedom. Today, more protest it happens in South Africa than anywhere in the world. No people, it seems, are more willing to stand up for their rights than South Africans. So for me, it's a special honor to be invited back to a country from which I was once banned for reporting a truly epic struggle for freedom. The words of my banning were unforgettable. You are not welcome, Mr. Pilger, said the man from state security, because you are a naughty troublemaker. I was intrigued by the word naughty, but I appreciated the compliment. In this lecture, I'd, last, I'd like to ask why the struggle for freedom has not been won. Why a form of apartheid still rules today and why this oppression has become a model for much of the world in the 21st century. I often think of the moment Nelson Mandela walked free in February 1990. Has there been such a split second in history when a leader and the liberation movement have had such moral power and people power? Speaking from the balcony of Cape Town City Hall, Mandela put the regime on notice. The people will not hesitate to fight back, he said. Now is the time to intensify the struggle. It was an angry, proud statement. The ANC was standing up. A new South Africa seemed possible. The next day there was a change. Mandela appeared to correct himself. I am not a communist, he reassured the white establishment. We will not dominate you, he said. What does this mean? The resistance in the townships was puzzled, confused, then dismayed when they heard that Mandela had written secretly to P.W. Bota offering special constitutional protection for whites and by implication for white power. Do you recognize, I later asked Tabo and Becky, that many people saw this as a betrayal? He replied, had we not made the historic compromises there would have been great suffering. In the liberal world, from Horton to Hampstead, this historic compromise took on a kind of spurious nobility. They had no choice, was the mantra. Yet the great suffering, and Becky said he feared, did happen and is still happening. It's a truly shocking fact that today more than half of all South Africans, more than 30 million people, live in poverty without adequate services, adequate education, adequate health care, security and jobs. Every day the majority are taunted by the privileges of the rich, white and black. It's not simply a matter of race now, but of the class people serve. This is not to diminish the gains such as laws barring discrimination, protecting workers' rights and legalizing abortion. But as Dale McKinley and others have written, the ability of ordinary people to claim these rights is almost entirely dependent on their political power and their wealth. In other words, their class. Less than a hundred kilometers from Johannesburg, the Madabang municipality is surrounded by four major dams, yet the residents, mostly poor people, have had no running water for most of 20 years. All their water is contaminated. 
All the pipes are broken, but they still get water bills for thousands of rand. Madibeng is the richest platinum mining belt in the world. The mines get plenty of water. Millions of litres flow through a modern infrastructure just as millions of rand flow into the coffers of the mining companies. The same is true of white or foreign-owned agribusiness. White farmers get all the money they want, unlike the majority. That's apartheid. Economic, racial, social apartheid. Madabang municipality is ANC controlled and ANC run. Jacques Poor's new book helps us, perhaps, to understand these issues. It's as powerful and revealing as the extraordinary work he and Max Dupre did on free Wigblatt, excuse my Afrikaans. It was anyway one of the bravest newspapers I've known. But the scandal surrounding the current president of South Africa are no more than symptoms of a system that denies water and decency and sometimes life itself to the majority. Like Donald Trump, Jacob Zuma is no more than a caricature of a system devised not to serve the majority. The ANC came to power pledging to honour the spirit of the Freedom Charter. The RDP became policy and ANC government would take over the mines, banks and monopoly industries. Any change or modification of our views on this is inconceivable. Those were Mandela's words. In the 1980s, having defaulted on a mounting debt, the apartheid state was running scared, and so was business. Led by the chairman of Anglo-American, Gavin Relly, the chieftains of South African capital met the ANC in Zambia, Oliver Tambo, Tavo and Becky, and others. Their message was straightforward. There'd be no peaceful transition, as they put it, unless an ANC government embraced an extreme version of the free market, a system in which social justice would not be a priority. More secret meetings followed between Mbeki and prominent members of the Africana elite at Mel's Park House, a stately home in England. I was told reliably they all got on famously around the fireplace there was malt whiskey and vintage wines, and they laughed about being served South African grapes, which were then the subject of a worldwide boycott. Calling the shots at these meetings were those who had underwritten the horrors of apartheid, such as the British mining giant Consolidated Goldfields, which picked up the tab for the whiskey and wine. The aim was to split the ANC between the so-called moderates, Tambo and Becky and Mandela, and the UDF in the townships. Time was running out. Declassified files I've seen in Washington leave little doubt that F.W. de Klerk was on notice from the White House to rescue capitalism in South Africa. When I met de Klerk in London, I put it to him that he and his white tribe were the real winners, and that the poverty of the majority would not change significantly. I asked him, isn't that apartheid by other means? Smiling through a cloud of cigarette smoke, he replied, you must understand that we achieved a broad consensus on many things. In 1992, the ANC surrendered the economic independence of this country. It agreed to repay the 25 
million dollars worth of apartheid era foreign debt and to accept the controls of the World Bank and the IMF. Exchange controls were abolished so that wealthy whites and corporations could take their capital overseas. Incredibly, Anglo-American and its treasure were allowed to flee to London. Just call me a Thatcherite, said Thabo Mbeki at a press conference, to announce an economic strategy known by its acronym GEAR. It was the same doctrine that had devastated emerging nations all over the world. There was one major difference. A gravy train for the few called BEE, -E, Black Economic Empowerment. Thereafter, the liberal elite, not the far right, but the liberal elite, politicians, business people, academics, journalists, white and black, drank the Kool-Aid of corporate speak. Harvard MBAs were quoted adoringly. ANC ministers were invited to the top table at the G8 meetings in Davos, where they were flattered with nonsense about their macroeconomic achievements. It was as if the rest of South Africa didn't exist, or they were ashamed that their country was mostly in the third world and that millions had nowhere to wash or shit. George Soros put it rather more bluntly, bluntly, South Africa, he said, is now in the hands of international capital. In 1994, the South African mining industry greeted democracy by sacking half its labor force. When Desmond Tutu held his truth and reconciliation hearings, the Chamber of Mines representing the most voracious, ruthless, profitable and lethal industry on earth showed its contempt by submitting just six and a half pages that bragged about the industry's patriotism. Today's swathes of South Africa might as well be Chernobyl. There were no reparations, no just compensation for rampant diseases and the suffering of countless people connected with mining. No South African industry offered a penny of its profits to mitigate poverty, not one. When the economist Sample Terra Blanche proposed a modest 0.5% tax on earnings over 2 million rand, the government killed it with silence. When a group of apartheid's victims took action in an American court against companies that had underwritten atrocities in South Africa and defied UN sanctions, the ANC asked the court to drop the case. Big business had got away with one of the great crimes against humanity. From the highest point in Alexandra Township, you can see the glass peaks of Santon City, Johannesburg's wealthiest shopping and residential municipality. Alex supplies Santon's servants, gardeners, chauffeurs, security guards. I took in the view and walked down the hill to a children's malnutrition centre. No one is ever quite sure about how many mal malnourished children there are in Alex because the population comes and goes and that is true of so many townships across the country. My guide was Mzwanele Mayakiso, a former leader of the National Civic Organization, part of the UDF. He had since studied in America and I asked him what he had learned from being in the United States. He considered his reply. I learned, he said, that we in South Africa 
are the model for a global apartheid right here. Alex up against Santon, very poor and very rich, side by side, but really a world apart. Look at American cities, he said. They're like Joburg now, and Joburg is becoming more like them. Detroit is almost identical, with the black majority tied down by poverty in the ghettos, and the whites in their glass mountains and gated suburbs, and a few rich blacks allowed on the golf course." Unquote. This is neoliberalism. It's also known as a shock doctrine. There's no safety net. You sink or swim. If you don't have work, you sink. If you get ill, you sink. If you have lots of money, you make a lot more money. Capital rules unconditionally. Labour is by and large disempowered and corralled. Actually, this was the big idea of Cecil Rhodes, who set up the first native reserve that paved the way for the 1913 Land Act, which confined black South Africans in pools of cheap labour. And this, by and large, is the principle of global apartheid today. Privatisation, selling off public assets and public land, is an essential component of this extreme system. When I interviewed Nelson Mandela, he said, you can call me a Thatcherite, but for this country, privatization is the fundamental policy, unquote. I replied, that's the opposite of what you said before the first elections. He answered, there is a process, and every process incorporates change. In South Africa, the process has been betrayal. If you think that's too harsh, consider yesterday's Sunday Times newspaper. On page nine, there is the shocking story of Michael Kamapi a six-year-old who drowned in a pool of feces when the primitive school toilet he was using collapsed. You probably saw it. Today the horror of Michael's death was described in detail in the High Court in Polakwani. Michael's parents and the local law centre are pursuing a civil claim against the government which denies that the pit latrine was less safe than in any other, was no less safe than in any other impoverished school. That's what they say. Unbelievable, but true. And it's taken more than three years for that to get to court. Now if you turn to page four, in the business section of the same paper. Here it is. It's a report of a party to celebrate the Sunday Times top 100 companies in South Africa. What fun they're having. Here's the Reserve Bank Governor, the Sedger Ganyago, with Barclays Africa CEO Maria Ramos, who has her arm around his shoulder. How reassuring to see Barclays, the sanctions buster of apartheid, restored to cosy respectability in the new South Africa. In this picture is Matrice Matsipi, South Africa's first black billionaire who received the Sunday Times Life Achievement Award and in a special report the headline says 
making South Africa a better place for all. The Sunday Times report reads as follows. I say hello to Patrice and his glowing wife Precious, who has just come back from Harvard, where she's involved in the Women and Policy program and is wearing a gorgeous lilac embellished gown. Patrice Massepi's story is one of firsts. He built the first black-owned mining business and today is in platinum and gold. And he's launching a new bank. A new bank, just what South Africa needs. Black economic empowerment gave this billionaire his big break. It didn't give Michael Kamapi a break, big or little. It didn't prevent little Michael. It didn't prevent little Michael drowning in feces, shit, his arm extended, a haunting symbolism I ask all of you here tonight to reflect on. Such a new empowered bourgeoisie, wrote Franz Fanon, and I quote him, has an historic mission that has nothing to do with transforming the nation. Their role as intermediary, that of the West business agent, unquote. Colonialism and imperialism may seem dated terms. They're often relegated in academic circles where Western power is regarded as a crisis manager in a turbulent, turbulent world instead of the cause of the crisis. In fact, colonialism and imperialism are right up to date. We're beginning to learn wrote Edward Said and his great classic, Culture and Imperialism. We're beginning to learn that decolonization was not the termination of imperial relationships, but merely the extending of a geopolitical web which has been spinning since the Renaissance. The modern media alone has the power to penetrate more deeply into a receiving culture than any previous manifestation of Western power and technology." Unquote. We have politics by corporate media. We have economics by corporate media, justice by media, censorship by media, apartheid by media. Even our common language is corporate and deceitful. We have free choice that isn't free or a choice. Reform that is regression, growth that diminishes, downsizing that destroys. And that noble word, democracy, has been emptied of its dictionary meaning. There is no democracy when Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa can morph from miners leader to millionaire and a seat on the board of London the company that owns the Maracana mine. There's no democracy. It... There's no democracy if Tweedledee, Zuma, is replaced by Tweedledum, Ramaphosa. <laughs> There's no democracy when 50,000 farm workers can be sacked overnight and up to 40% of South Africans are out of work and a third of those with jobs earn less than $2 a day. There's no democracy when a six-year-old boy can drown in a school toilet. The freedom that was fought for by the woman in the photograph who stood between the hippos is a freedom that has to be won all over again. But how? Actually, many people don't need to be told how. South Africans are world champions at resistance. 
Remember the draconian secrecy bill, the Protection of State Information Bill in 2013 that was approved by Parliament's ANC majority and awaited only Jacob Zuma's signature. It was stopped by massive direct action. As Terry Bell wrote recently, had this bill become law, the revelations about corruption and the capture of state institutions by an affected gangster cabal would not have come to light. Perhaps Marikana was a turning point. The uprising that followed was not just in mining, but in industries across the country and in agriculture, especially the winelands. People and their history are never still. This month is the centenary of the great uprising of working people in Russia. The inspiration of ordinary women and men achieving the seeming impossible has acute relevance in South Africa. This country is not Zuma or Gupta. It's not lifetime awards for billionaires. It's not Tudor castles in Constantia or streets of white walls empty except for the servants of the rich. That's a facade. This country is a humanism, Ubuntu, which Steve Biko described as an authentic communalism. Ubuntu is not owned by any political party, neither it is it an enduring legacy, neither is the enduring legacy of resistance in this country. Of course, there are many questions. Not everything that is faced can be changed, wrote the great American poet James Baldwin, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. The independent trade unions, NUMSA, and of course SAFTU, together with the great civic and social movements and the myriad grassroots organizations, the NGOs, are a political force unique, unique to South Africa. They represent a reconstitute, reconstituted and true people power which has the potential to build a popular unity that could change this country and even deliver real freedom. How exciting that would be. Thank you. Comrades and friends, as the program says, we're going to allow for questions and discussion in line with the objectives of the Trust in promoting democracy. It's your turn to speak. Professor Brian Williams. Uh, firstly to John. Um, I think all of us are deeply honored to have you here. Um, I think almost everyone in this room, in this hall, in one or other way, have directly contributed to the struggle and at an emotional level, uh, in terms of resources, have contributed and, and all these different impacts, human impacts, as a consequence of being deeply involved in the kinds of struggle based on the analysis that you have presented. One of the important points that you share with all of us is the importance of information research information that can help to expose not only what is happening locally but to connect what is happening globally to global events and imperialism. In terms of the battle of ideas, many of us expected the University of the Left, the University of the Western Cape, to in fact play a leading role in providing the beacons of hope and intellectual power to guide us in terms of what we ought to do. Sadly, in 2012, February 2012, William Hague, Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, was at the University of the Western Cape. He's a warmonger. 
In March of 2012, the University of the Western Cape leadership tried everything to prevent the Cuban ambassador from speaking there. In August 2012, a global warmonger, Hillary Clinton, was at the University of the Western Cape. Many people may not even know that while we speak that the doors of learning should be open at UWC, undergraduate classes have been shut down, starting in the law faculty. Those of us who, tr who tried our best to open up the spaces within the university were demonized. Two high court cases against the leadership for violating the rule of law. And so the university of the left, we should have provided the platform on which we stimulate our thinking in line with you. And the things that you have said have sadly failed us. So the challenge to all of us in this room is how do we take forward the kind of messages that you have presented and my final point to you, uh, John, is how did you manage to emotionally survive all the onslaughts against you? Because given what you have presented, you must have been able, you must have been subjected to some of the worst kinds of threats, the worst kinds of pressures. So I would like to know how you responded in dealing with uh, all those pressures and threats. Thanks. You know, I, I said in there the privilege of journalism and the pr privilege of... Uh, a position like mine, I expected. Um, but they're nothing compared with the pressures felt by people who have no voice, who have no power. It's easy to come to South Africa as a foreigner, land at Cape Town, drive to a nice hotel, go to nice places and leave again and not have a clue about the majority of this country. That's true of many countries, of course, but particularly so, particularly so in this country. They're the people, the people, the unseen people, who withstand, who, who had every right to expect, um, if not a revolution, I don't think people were expecting a revolution. They were expecting the beginnings, the honest, the well-intentioned, the good faith to build a social democracy. The trappings of a social democracy were built, of course. But the actual social democracy in which there is social justice and economic justice as well as electoral justice for the majority of the, of of the people of this country, that was not built. That ought to have been built, that was betrayed. Those are the people, those are the people who feel the pressure. And those of us who have the privilege to go into people's lives, to hear their stories, and then take their accounts to the, into the offices of the powerful and challenge the powerful, like myself, um, that's our job. It's a duty. The lecture was absolutely marvelous. And I do believe that it should not, not be limited to the people in this hall. I believe that Mr. Bobby Wilcox and the people who organized this meeting tonight to obtain the lecture that was given to us here this evening. It is jolly good and it must not remain in this hall. It's got to go out to the people. Uh, the people who organize this meeting must have it printed and it must be circulated to schools, to whatever meetings we go to. It must be there to give to people. That is how we are going to get uh, some form of progress politically within South Africa. Thank you. I want to thank Mr. Poja very much for what he has given us here this evening and I'm sure that we have all profited. Uh, John, where do you get your news from? Because I, I, where do you get your news from? There's very f few media sources that we can trust today. All right.
Well, you know, where I get my news from is freely available to you and to all of you. We now have the, the magic of the internet, uh, which means that you can bypass much of the corporate media and go to sources of news and sources of analysis uh, that we wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity to see and to understand. Um, where do I get my news from? I mean, I could sit here and reel off a whole lot of websites, uh, but really that's what I do. First thing in the morning, instead of picking up a newspaper, I log on and look at various websites. Um, they range from uh, websites like um, uh, consortiumnews.com, counterpunch.com, uh, information clearinghouse, and, and many others. Um, I'd be pleased to give you a list if you like, but it's really about just logging on and really following your own instincts and navigating through the net. It's not all that difficult. There is some really ridiculous stuff on the internet. We know that. But there's also some, there's also some wonderful journalism. There are people who are producing journalism for nothing, uh, who give us the kind of analysis we're not going to get uh, on television, on television news. We're not going to get in the kind of commercial straitjacket of much of the corporate news. Uh, so that's where I get my news. I've, yes, I do watch. Um, I watch BBC and I watch various other um, uh, television channels, but I really watch them to monitor them rather than to get information from them. Um, to deconstruct them. It's not, there's not, I don't sense when I'm sitting in front of them, I can relax. So I usually have a, a notebook and start writing things down and um, uh, notes which probably I do nothing with. But so that's, that, to, that to me is what the main media, and you must remember that television is still the main source of people's information, free to air television. I have to say in South Africa I'm struck by, uh, in spite of these critical words of the corporate media, there are, um, there is a sense, even in the, this Sunday Times I read out to you, um, they, you know, they had an excellent report on the family of six-year-old Michael and, and the time that their parents have had to wait to take this action against the government. But it was hard up against this, this grotesque party thrown by the Sunday Times at which the editor of the Sunday Times was introducing all these people like Trevor Manuel who once said I'm going to make South Africa a country for winners. Or, or Alec Irwin, who is uh, minister, I think, for public policy, who, who uh, was responsible for that disastrous policy of, of inviting foreign investment, uh, which included an arms deal. And there is the, the utterly corrupt uh, British aerospace deal, which they promised to build a couple of big factories and plants. I can't remember exactly what they were. As long as South Africa bought a lot of Hawk jets. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, that, this is suckering a government. This is international capital taking a country and its movement for a ride. Um, and these people are at this party, all dressed up and having a, a nice time and telling each other how wonderful they were. So this, here we have it in one newspaper, both. So it's very interesting that to me.
uh, in a way that is an authentic reflection of South, South Africa. I mentioned in my address Santon and Alexander, Zandra, side by side, yet a world apart. Here we have the story of Michael and his parents uh, side by side with a black billionaire and his friends and, and ministers who were meant to represent the likes of Michael and his parents but didn't, side by side, a reflection in a way of a kind of apartheid within the newspaper itself. We're here as a group of young activists, right? And we really appreciated your inputs. I think a lot of us young folk miss certain crucial parts of South African history. And you were able to take us through all of those important times really well. So thank you very much for that. What I'm curious about, um, and this is in the spirit of what Martin said in engaging about the input that you gave here today, is we're, we're thirsty for a reimagined political regime or systems or future. So what are your thoughts on that in moving forward beyond social democracy? Because as you end your input and you start referencing old forgive the word tired, but capture trade unions, I feel like we have to start beginning to think about how we really want to live. Um, and also in just considering the 19th and 12th century that we're celebrating this year as well. Thank you. Because I, I, I suggested in the latter part of my address, uh, I do think that there isn't an ideal prescription but that the ingredients of the prescription are here already. That's what makes South Africa so interesting and so hopeful and probably unique because there are so, so many grassroots popular movements. Uh, the trade union movement does have a history, a history much of it is betrayed. I have to say, betrayed through bureaucracy and taking jobs with the state and its coziness with the state. But there is that tradition here. And already we've seen, as I mentioned, the declaration of independence of unions like NUMSA and then the formation of SAFTU. But with, with all, my feeling is that it's a coming together of the unions and the grassroots and the social movements. One thing that has to be addressed, that was never addressed at the time of, of, uh, of, of independence, yes, that's the word, of independence, was the infor so-called informal economy. These people who dash around the world receiving plaudits for their macroeconomic genius, uh, none of them gave a thought to the massive numbers, the millions of people who live, eke out a living in the informal economy. This was a whole group, massive group, almost a nation within the nation of South Africans who, it seemed, whose lives and destinies didn't matter and were not worth organizing. And the, it's almost as if they gave up. Let's not organize those people because how can we organize homeless people? How can we organize transient people? How can we organize people who uh, have a job one day and don't the next and, and so on? But it has been done. In India, the organization of people who are literally at the bottom has happened in the most extraordinary way by mass, by mass movement, mass organization. But it needs a will. It needs, a, it needs a, dare I say it, a political party, a political force in the townships, in the townships in the centers of abandoned cities like Johannesburg, organizing the people who have been completely left out, who don't even appear on the radar. That is, that, that, they are a resource because
the greatest resource in this country are the people. There's no, that's, I know that sounds trite and everything, but it's not. It's true. They are the resource. And that wasn't even touched in 94. It, it was immediately straight to this bourgeois sense, this sort of fake idea of, 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 a, of, a, uh, of a society where power dripped down from above, um, which was doomed. The whole idea of it was doomed because it didn't include the majority. But the grassroots movement in this country, the NGOs, the popular movements, who have had some spectacular successes. I'm thinking of treatment action campaign as one, just the dy dynamism of that campaign, and so many others in education and in health and in the townships. There has to be a coming together with the unions of all these organizations. It's only, and that's a mass movement, that's a popular change. I understand that there's a big wall between that idea and that happening, and it's got ANC written on it. Uh, and no one, no one suggests that the ANC doesn't have an honorable uh, and proud history. But for the ANC to be in the position it is in at the moment, disregarding the majority so demonstrably uh, is an untenable state for this country. I mean, I think you've done a nice overview of, uh, sorry, my name is Dale, um, to deal with the how the ANC's hegemony in the 1980s over the mass movement was quite critical to the formation of the new South Africa and the form that it took, uh, which was basically a form against the struggle of the 1980s and the aspirations of the people then. But just as we speak about the decades long now struggle against the new ANC regime in terms of its lack of delivery, in terms of its lack of producing what its program and manifestos have said. I think that is the kernel of the difficulty that we are confronted with today. To say that there is all this raw material out there without having a focus, without having a political ideology. And I think the, one of the previous speakers alluded to this. I think you can't simply say that there is this inherent resistance without forming a political way in which this resistance can be organized. Now we know that we are not just sitting still and the other side is also fast asleep. The bourgeoisie in this country is also concerned about the decay and de decay of the, of the ANC. That they are not sitting quite quietly. They are mobilizing as we speak. They are backing the Cyril camp in the ANC national elections. They are backing the Democratic Alliance as a liberal alternative to the ANC. So they have also their plans. The point is, what is the political orientation of the working class given 23 years of non-delivery, given 23 years of corruption, given 23 years of Michaels falling down the toilets? What? are we doing and what is the political motivation and organization that is needed to make this effective? I think organizing for change has to come from the people who are already organizing for change. The people who are already at grassroots level. The people who are already principled unionists. Um, I'm not quite sure that you're suggesting that they should have a particular strict ideology imposed on them. Obviously it's a socialist. It's a socialist um, worldview that 
I think all these people share, but they may and almost certainly do have a different view of that, a different view of how that can be brought into practice, a different view of, of uh, a different view, say, of regulation, a different view of state ownership. I don't think we're even close to that yet. And if you're asking, I think now, for to predict an ideology or for someone to say what ideology should um, really draw together all these groups, I don't think it's the time for that. I would only say that it's clearly, it's clearly a socialist movement. It always was a socialist movement. Every movement in this country that was, that was progressive and enlightened, although many had huge differences, was a socialist movement. Whether it was civics people fighting in as part of the UDF or if it was ANC people fighting in uh, uh, outside the country, whether it was splinter groups, uh, whether going back it was the PAC, they all shared, they all shared generally um, a, a, a support for socialism. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So that's really the only way I can answer your question. That in, in one sense, the ideology is there already. Now what's needed is action. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Podger, for another breathtaking um, report on our condition. And it's not, I suppose, uh, we don't want to put you in the hot chair in trying to solve our problems for us. I think it's unfair of us to ask you to do that. Uh, but I want to just raise one point and ask, another, and ask a question. One point that I want to raise is that um, we all know that the politi political leadership um, has abandoned us. Um, but it's also, I feel a lot that the, 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 the new civil service that replaced the old civil servants, the white civil servants, I often feel they also abandoned us. And the state captured or usurped all our activists into the government and into NGOs, leaving a huge vacuum behind um, that is difficult uh, to, um, to fill. And the struggle is how to do that and how, um, and how we can um, build a new um, uh, resistance um, from the ground up. But my question to you really is, so what about China? And how, do, how, do, how does the imminent war against China, how does it impact on Africa? And what will be the outfall of that for Africa? Thank you. Underreported, the dangers of, of, of nuclear war when you have the two, two great uh, nuclear powers, Russia and China, effectively encircled. That encirclement doesn't appear to be contentious in the news, and yet it offers a very grave threat to the world. And it's not simply a threat um, through the personality of Donald Trump. It has been a threat for 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 many years, but it's becoming, it's, it's, it's now getting to the point where the United States as a unique imperial power, there's been no power like the US, feels itself challenged, feels its dominance challenged for the first time. Since 1945, the U.S. has had pretty much the world as it wanted to. It, it's wanted to cast us all in its image. Uh, it succeeded to some degree, 
but it certainly demonstrated an enormous military and economic power. Its, its commercial power uh, is, uh, was, was unparalleled until within the space of little more than a generation, China rose. The rise of China is the most extraordinary, I would say, phenomenon, perhaps, uh, of my lifetime. Uh, something like six or seven hundred million people have been taken out of poverty and created in a, what is effectively a new middle class in China. Uh, a, a powerhouse in terms of manufacturing, in terms of development, uh, in terms of banking, uh, has developed under the nose of the Western powers, which actually took very, they took very little real interest until it became very clear that China had progressed to the point where it would soon pass the United States as the world's first economic power. It, al it already is the world's greatest power in terms of currency. It owns most of reserve dollars. Most of America's currency is owned by the United States, uh, is owned by China. Uh, so its power is there, it's manifest. Um, but what to do with this power? Because it's clearly not, China has made it clear that it's not a military, it's going to be a military power, but it has no intention of doing what the Soviet Union tried to do so disastrously, and that was to face off the United States in terms of military power. Uh, but it is an economic power and it will, it, will, it will undoubtedly succeed in that way. So we're in uncharted waters. There is no question about that. Uh, in the United States, the strategic thinking on this is limited to say the least. Um, instead of understanding that uh, there has to be a partnership with China. There is still this sense there has to be, China has to be a rival to be confronted. That puts, that puts us all in a very dangerous position when you have the admiral in charge of the Pacific US fleet, the biggest in the world, saying that he was quite prepared to launch what he called the unthinkable. Now, American admirals and generals have often used this r rhetoric to scare the rest of us, and they've done it very successfully, but they often do follow it up with dropping bombs on a lot of people. And they've already dropped nuclear bombs on one country and almost dropped nuclear bombs on other countries, such as Korea and China in the 1950s, so we have to take it very seriously. And that's why a voice from, from countries, regional powers in a sense, like South Africa, are so important. Um, the spread of the US military throughout Africa since 2011, when the invasion of Libya gave the Americans the opportunity to establish AFRICOM, their command headquarters in Addis. Uh, since then, the spread through all but one African country of special forces, uh, of, Amer of military trainers, and so on, is in terms of numbers, there aren't that many, but in terms of provocation, uh, the dangers are acute. Because throughout Africa, there is Chinese development. Many African countries 
have had very successful arrangements with Chinese uh, companies in building roads and bridges and powerhouses in a sort of resources swap. But it's one that has benefited a number of countries. Not always, but in many cases it has. And the Americans have woken up to this uh, influence in Africa rather late. And they're responding to it with the really the only power, the only real power, dominant power that they now have, and that is military power, because the Chinese are effectively the greatest economic power. So that's a dangerous situation. And it means that a country like South Africa should be speaking against it, should be prepared to tread on toes, should be prepared to offend Washington. Offending Washington is, is absolutely crucial now of standing up and saying this is our continent, our region, uh, we don't want your great power rivalries and, and wars and provocation here. Um, that would take quite courageous but visionary politics to do it. It could be done diplomatically, but I sense the, the, the situation is urgent and we do need to hear from countries that, um, that are affected by this. And really South Africa is in this very special position. It would be listened to. There's no question about that. It would be listened to. So the voice has to come from here. And perhaps the voice can only be heard when there is another kind of government in this country, when there is another kind of political sense, a reckoning of equality and understanding of internationalism. Perhaps that produces that voice. Um, I don't know, but it certainly, people need to be speaking out pretty quickly. Thank you so much, John. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you t tackled the idea of um, AFRICOM and what it's doing to the rest of Africa. <clears throat> My, um, the reason I'm asking this is um, in light of um, what the West did to the Middle East and we saw how it ravaged um, autonomous states and they did a practice with Libya and now they're turning African forces into training grounds for what's to come. My greatest fear is this geopolitical rhetoric that keeps saying Africa is the new frontier. Is it the new frontier to destroy? Where are we headed with, um, with the U.S. deploying over 33 bases across Africa and turning our dictators into buddies? they becoming like farm managers in, um, um, in Animal Farm, the book. All our dictators are being embraced now across Africa. I'm, I'm not from South Africa, but I'm, I w live and work here. But um, all our former dictators and current dictators are being embraced, turned into their bodies to manage the rest of Africa. Where is our fate? Thank you. Well, you're right to raise the point, uh, because there's been a whole series of massive bribes up and down the African continent when a lot of these autocrats uh, have been uh, bribed with the, the sort of arms and military deals that allow a great deal of money to go into their own pockets. Um, and so it's been a, a wholly destructive situation. It's particularly so, it's, it's, it has of course the, uh, the, the, the cry of terrorism behind it but that's got nothing to do with it. Um, it, it is about, it is about, uh, in one sense, it's about the U.S. ensuring that the eight or nine hundred bases, military bases, that it has around the world are, are, are not reduced by, by political forces back at home. That's very unlikely but shoring up its military position around the world and creating, if you like, 
a new area of interest, a new area of conflict in Africa is part of a kind of political movement to keep its, its, the, 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 to keep these bases running. These bases are amazing. I mean, there are so many of them. And in Africa, Africa has most of what they call lily pad bases, which are secret bases. Uh, what are they doing on these secret bases? Well, they're usually special forces, and the special forces and the U.S. has done some deal with the governments, as it's done particularly in East Africa, in Uganda, uh, to, uh, to, to operate there. And these special forces are presumably waiting to spring on Chinese engineers or something. There's, there's, a, there's a, a true absurdity about this. What the hell are they doing there? Uh, they're there because they're there. It is because the idea of U.S. universality, of the U.S. imperium, must not be challenged. That is felt very, very deeply in, among, particularly among a militarized class in the United States. There's no doubt that 9-11 had an extraordinary impact in, in the U.S. and brought about, I would think, uh, something almost of a military coup. The ascendancy of the military, of the Pentagon, of military thinking, military strategic thinking through all its multiplicity of think tanks, through the State Department, through all the great intelligence agencies and national security agencies, so that thinking of military control and military reach, um, whereas it was always there to some degree, but never in the way it is now. So you have a great military state actually applying this, this, this ideology, this military idea, this idea, this idea that military um, puts down an American presence in a country and that's the end of it. The, the American presence then is reinforced. It's, it, it, so it's not just simply sitting there and waiting, waiting for war to break out with the Chinese. It is, it is about America um, all over the world everywhere and having its right to be all over the world you only have to talk to senior US military officers who are involved in this and they they could be wearing a pith helmet you know they have a a sense of their own righteousness their own right to be in other people's countries there is there is no argument within their own milieu against that and that's what that is. It's, it's very dangerous, and you're, and you're right to be worried about and aware of it. And again, I say it's a, it's a, a large regional country like South Africa, which distinguishes itself by doing a lot of unilateral and multilateral trade deals and, and, and spreading the, the, uh, its, uh, the gift of its, of its capitalism throughout the continent, it should be doing something rather more positive and warning other African countries of the dangers of having a superpower in its midst. Um, you refer to, to, to this matter in, in your address, in, 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 um, just like in South Africa, you know, we have politicians that have been um, got into the pockets of, of people with lots of money. In Africa, uh, there are politicians, African politicians are used to legitimize um, transactions between mining capital and other capitalists from Europe and America and African countries. But our South African media, they don't, the South African journalists do not have the same geopolitical consciousness that, that one finds among journalists in the Middle East and in Latin America. 
Um, I would like you to, to comment on that, you know, looking from outside. Well, if South African journalists don't have a worldview, then you as a reader of newspapers and a viewer of television and a listener of radio should um, take direct action and find those who do have a worldview. Um, I think in many respects South African journalists um, really do as well in many respects even better than many journalists. I mentioned um, two today and one of whom is gaining some infamy yet again and, and brilliantly, Jacques Poor. Um, he and his great partner Max Dupre um, had their offices of their newspaper bombed and uh, uh, both were in great danger for many years. Uh, there is an honorable tradition of journalists in this country trying, trying their best to give what might be called a world view. That said, there is a corporate journalism that is very, very similar to the corporate journalism elsewhere in the UK or the United States or or wherever. Um, so that means you should look elsewhere. We shouldn't be passive. We shouldn't be waiting around saying, why don't South African journalists have a world view? We should go and find those who do. And the internet is full of them. Okay. Comrades, we've come to the end of our program. I dare not try and summarize. That's not my role here. Um, I suppose just to propose a vote of thanks to a number of groups and people. I think the first one is the Athlone Policing Forum, yes, Athlone the <laughs> Policing Forum for providing security um, inside and outside. Um, they're the ones with the, the bibs. Then our media partners. Cape Town TV and Radio 786 and then all of you for coming this is as I said it's the inaugural lecture and then the workers world staff who put in quite a lot of effort to make this event a success um, in, in particular Halger Johnson Jauchberg And then our guest for coming all the way to address us, John Polger. <laughs> and last but not least, the Abdullah Ahmad Saluji Trust for sponsoring the event. <laughs> Comrades, we've come to the end of the event. Once again, thank you for attending. And we're going to have a database with all of you and we'll inform you of the next lecture in 2018. Thank you very much.